Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit, live here from E3 2012 in Los Angeles. As always, I am joined by the legendary Mike Legg from Petroglyph. He's going to be showing us the latest advancements in End of Nations, which we've been covering quite a bit. This is the first time we've actually seen the other faction. So, Mike, welcome to the show. Tell Thank us a little bit so about much. what's going on here. Well, let's see. Here at E3, um, we're showing a new map called Icebreaker, and uh, it's a uh, 2v2, or two, yeah, two versus two map, Liberation Front versus Shadow Revolution. And uh, what we're also showing is we're showing um, elite companies okay. that, we'll, that I'll explain a little bit about. But first of all, um, in, in this map, there's an Order of Nations ship that has basically become uh, captured in the ice up in the, up in the north, in the yeah. Arctic. And so uh, basically what's happening is uh, the, two, the two factions are battling over this ship to see who can take control of it to capture the resources from the ship. So this is the first time we've shown this map. It's a 2v2. It's uh, got a lot of amazing uh, tactical strategies to it. There's resource points to capture to give you money. There's victory points to capture. If you can capture two victory points, it'll take the shields down on your enemy's headquarters. Uh, there's Gatling turrets to, to, uh, to destroy that are, that are defending the enemy's side. And we also have these unmanned ground vehicle facilities, uh, these factories that you can upgrade while you're playing. And um, you also want to take them out on the enemy as well as defend them on your side. So this is an all new map that we've never shown before. So we're, we're, we've been having a lot of fun playing this here at E3. On top of that, we also added, and what we're showing here is um, elite companies. And elite, uh, what you've seen now up in with End of Nations is you've seen uh, Alpha Company and Bravo Company and Charlie Company, they're completely customizable by you. You, yeah. can, you, can, you can put the units in them, mix and match and change and put in your own hero, put in your own tactical structures, put in your own special abilities. But with the elite companies, these are pre-built companies that have already been pre-designed. They have a unique look, they have a unique sound, and you, ke you can't take them out of these companies. And right here we're playing with the Blitz. So their Blitz is uh, based in Berlin. Uh, these guys kind of have a World War I kind of feel to them. Um, they have a, uh, they're very, very, very much about uh, offensive and assault. Okay. So, so they're, they're, um, they're really cool. If you guys zoom in a little bit on them, you can kind of get a look, you can see the half tracks. And you can see the the Ramsteins there and the uh, the main boss unit. And so these guys are really a lot about you know uh, offensive offensive power. You can see these guys are like in their kind of their stormtrooper armor. And they'll they'll when they're standing still they'll juggle uh, grenades. And so uh, they're a lot of fun. So this is a great kind of pre-assembled uh, company for players to have a really good time with. You know, and they don't have to worry about kind of micromanaging at what units work well together. So they're complementary. On the flip side, we also have another company called uh, Liberté Brigade. And they're based out of uh, Montreal. And uh, they're all about defense. And they have a, uh, they have a really awesome um, artillery unit that's very long range, very powerful. And when it, moves, it moves around very slow. But when you get it into position, you lock it down, you entrench it, and then you protect it. It also comes with uh, badger units that are, these, uh, th that are also very good defensive units. What they'll do is they'll also entrench, and then they've got rocket launchers that are great for both air and uh, other units that you're battling against. And then on top of that, we have these other units called white mice, and they sneak around the map. They're, they're stealth. They don't attack, but they have a stealth ability. And as long as the enemy doesn't see them moving, they won't lock on and attack them. And you can take these units, move them into the enemy territory, and spot for that long-range artillery that's parked farther back at your base. And so you move that, you get that artillery all entrenched, then, and the, the artillery unit's called the moose, the big unit, and then what you do is you lay a bunch of turrets down around it to help defend it, and you've got your two badgers helping defend it, and then you just start, you sneak those mice in, unveil that part of the map, the strategic locations, and then you just have that thing just shoot from far away, and it just rains down damage across the map, and a lot of players don't even know where it's coming from. Yeah, positional play seems to be really important in the end of Nations, even in these smaller maps. This being the first time that we've seen a small 2v2 scenario. We've seen some really big fights thus far. This is a massively multiplayer online RTS. Where does a, a small battle like this actually fit into the overall large-scale metagame? It, well, it's a territory, and so, you know, so when you're playing for your faction, you know, the more victories you have in this map, the more the more victories tally up for your faction. So, you know, if the Liberation Front or, you know, Shadow Revolution get more victories within this map, they'll take control of the map in the metagame on, on the world map. 
and then obviously the other faction is going to have to come in and take more victories to like take control of the map as well. So, so yeah, it doesn't matter if it's like you know it could be a twenty you know a twenty eight versus twenty eight player map, you know, real big map, or it could be some small maps. But your goal is just you got to take control of those territories, and the more territories that you control at the end of the metagame season, um, you know that'll determine the victory for you if you, you know if you to win the metagame. Do you anticipate a lot of players deciding, you know what, I'm not really a big fan of the big battles, I just want to do the smaller ones, and will there be any penalty for doing that? Not at all. In fact, we, we think that, you know, we want people to be very comfortable with this game as, uh, as if you're a traditional MM, or if you're a traditional RTS gamer, yep. and you love playing RTS, we want to give you everything that you're comfortable with within your RTS. You know, we've got a story campaign that you can play through, you can play it solo, your friends can come in and join you and help you. You know, we've got cooperative game modes, we've got competitive game modes, we've got you know, things like Capture the Flag. And so, you know, I think, I think a lot of players will probably, you know, find a lot of fun in 4v4 and 8v8, or even, or even you know, just playing comp stomps with their friends. Yeah. You know, you don't have to go do the massive, massive scale battles. You can have a lot of fun just playing stuff that you're very comfortable with. The great thing is, though, from your battle, you get a victory. You know, your commander's gonna level up. You're gonna get money. You could buy more things to bolster your armies. So you know, even playing smaller battles, you know, you're gonna get a lot of good rewards for it. It'll feel very, re you know, rewarding. I personally, I'm terrible at those large scale battles because yeah. I'm not, I'm not a great online RTS player. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get my butt kicked pretty fast. Yeah. So I kind of like these smaller focused maps. You know, where I'm like, you know, working with a few people and we're really working in conjunction to like, you know, w you know, hone out our strategy. Yeah, it certainly makes perfect sense. You did mention PvE there, and we have heard about the conflict with the NPC faction, which is, if I recall correctly, the Order of Nations. Yes. Now, how does that fit in? How would a mission against the Order of Nations actually play out versus what we're seeing here? Well, an Order of Nations mission, you know, you, you'd obviously you'd be playing entirely against AI-controlled players. So Order of Nations is always AI-controlled. They're never controlled by a player. And in some cases, you can actually team up and play with, you can forge a temporary alliance, you know, Shadow Revolution and Liberation Front, they can forge a temporary alliance and play together to mm -hmm. try and drive the Order of Nations from a particular territory. You know, some of your battles might be uh, infiltration battles where you're trying to like work your way through tons and tons of defenses to work into a uh, Order of Nations base to get in and capture some kind of technology or, or destroy their headquarters or destroy a satellite array or something like that. Other times, you're trying to fend off and just hold off an area where you just entrench and you have waves of attackers coming at you. You know, so you're just trying to almost, you know, turtle in and see how far, you know, if you can survive 40 waves of attackers, you can win that territory. And so that allows you to like play with the other faction, you know, co cooperatively. So like you forge that temporary alliance and you work together. Now you mentioned sort of like 40 waves there as an example. Now, what about a player that just, wants to play for 10, 20 minutes, what kind of rewards can he get from playing for a short period of time? You'll always, you know, when you, when you play, you know, and, and, and you have a victory, um, whether you win or lose, you'll always get experience. You know, so you will, so that you'll, every victory that you compete in, you know, whether you win or lose, you're going to gain experience, and that'll, that'll, that'll allow your commander to level up, you know, and, and unlock new skills and new abilities and, and new, new units and things like that. Um, but then also when you win a battle, you'll gain in-game wealth. And with that wealth, you accrue enough wealth, that allows you to buy, you know, more units for your army and more customizable skins and, you know, whatever's available in the game for purchase. Yeah, microtransaction model has always been an interesting one with this. Uh, and I, if I recall correctly, you were thinking about allowing players to actually buy skins with in-game currency, which is unusual for a lot of free-to-play games. They generally have cosmetic skins as a premium-only option. Yeah, we're going to have a mix of both, actually. Okay. What we're going to do is there'll be a set of, of skins that people can purchase to, you know, to customize. So if there's a player that isn't paying, but they're just in grinding and having fun and, and building up money. They can buy some of the different skins, but then we will definitely sell some unique customization options, definitely customizable skins, only to the paying player. And even some of the um, the uh, retail versions, the box versions, they'll have special skins, skins available them, yeah. only to those. So if you buy that particular boxed retail version, there might be some certain skins and certain in-game items that are specific to that version to give you some more unique functionality. But the game is definitely, there's no pay to win in the game. You know, every, you, you can't buy power, but you can buy convenience and you can buy customization. Okay, makes perfect sense. So this battle's been raging now for about 10 minutes or so. 
and the allies seem to be the ones winning at present. Now, there are various special powers available that you can actually call down here. We've seen a lot of powers from the Liberation Front. How do the powers from the other faction actually differ? Liberate, oh, so Sha um, Shadow Revolution, they're a splinter group that is spun off of Order of Nations. So they're a bit more um, high tech. You know, Liberation Front is more, you know, your, your modern military, traditional heavy weaponry, you know, tanks and big aircraft and, you know, uh, armored infantry and things like that, where Shadow Revolution, they have a lot more um, things that involve uh, stealth and subterfuge, uh, hacking. They employ a lot of nanotechnology. So they have a, like a higher technology curve. They're very much like a hit and run kind of group. They're faster moving. You know, they're a lot, they're a lot faster. They're lighter. They can't take a, as much of a beating as the other guys, but they can definitely, you know, definitely get in, you know, do some serious damage and get out. And they have different like types of, um, you know, abilities and things like that that allow them to hack. They can they can shut down, you know, certain certain units or certain uh, structures on your side. Um, you know, they can also uh, do sat scans and reveal more of the map. You know, they're kind of more information based and you know. Very, very cloak and dagger, a lot of subterfuge and stuff, and that's what Shadow Revolution's all about. Fantastic. They're so definitely they're more of a finesse class. Yeah, those who like to be nice and sneaky and pull off something particularly strategic, that might be the faction for them, especially if you like the high-tech stuff. So, my question has now disappeared from my mind. It's very inconvenient. Okay, so, are you rewarded for keeping units alive? So far, we've seen what could be considered to be a bit of a meat grinder. A lot of units have died on both sides thus far. If you were a player with exceptional micromanagement, for instance, are you rewarded? Is, does your unit get experience or? The units, well, the units actually don't, the units don't level up themselves. They don't, the units don't get experience, but what you can do is, so if your units don't die off, you, you will not lose that money because you have a tactical economy mm -hmm. where as, you're, as you capture resource points or as your faction or your team, your allies, capture resource points, you're going to have a trickle of income, of money that's going to be constantly coming in that you can use to spend to upgrade, uh, you know, unlock super weapons, you know, upgrade facilities that you've captured. But you also have to use that money to, when you lose a unit, to to call a replacement unit in, you have to spend that money too. So if you're not, lo if, so if you're losing units all the time and you're, you'll, you'll constantly be spending your money replacing them and you won't have any money to really spend on upgrading tactical structures or capturing, you know, or, or unlocking like super weapons and things to use mm -hmm. that way. Now we also, like you said, we do let you, um, you were talking about up the, the units uh, leveling up. What we do allow is the units can be completely individually customized with mods. Each unit has two or three mod slots, and when you're when you're back out at the um, at the global view, and you, you know, and you're in your armory, you can go and individually customize each unit, where you could have mod technology like things that give you uh, more speed, or they could give you uh, better armor, or better visual range, or more attack power, or more chance of a critical hit. You know, it's being able to see farther or, or um, you know, lot, you know, enhanced uh, shot range so you can shoot farther than normal. So, you say you have like a really slow tank that's really, you know, it, you know, the only thing you're only complaining about is it's well armored, it's super powerful, but it just drives too slow. Yep. You could go into your, your, your into your armory and add three speed mods to that tank, and that tank will now drive a lot faster. And that gives you kind of a unit by unit customization ability, but you don't do it in the heat of battle, you do it while you're while yeah. you're out of the battle. How are the mods actually acquired in the game? What are the different ways of getting them? Mods are acquired just, you know, basically as you as you level up, new mods become available to you. And um, they're also at one point at one point, and I I don't know if this is still the case, mods used to be rewards for mission completion. Mm. And um, there was discussion of should that still be the case or not? I think they're still uh, the design team is still locking that down. But at one point, you'd finish a mission, and mods would get added to your um, to your inf uh, your inventory, yeah. so that after a battle, you'd unlock new mods, and sometimes you'd get a more rare mod. And um, that was the case I last saw, and I I'm not completely sure if that is still the plan or if it's just going to be as you gain up to a new as you as you level up, you'll be able to unlock new mods. And then they are purchased. They are purchased with you know in-game wealth. In-game wealth, yeah. as opposed to microtransactions. Yeah, and then they don't lock into. They don't. They're not permanently affixed. You can get them with microtransaction money too. You okay. can buy them with with right. both. And um, but the um, but you can also uh, de-equip the mods and assign them to other units. So if you get a more powerful mod for one of your higher level units or your more powerful units, 
you can take another mod and move it to another one of your units, uh, you know, in your in your um, in your army. So you don't you never permanently lose a mod. Fantastic. Now, there's a couple of questions I want to ask. The first one being on the subject of clan support. Obviously, this is very much a team-based game. Working with your friends would be to your advantage. What kind of support do you have for that within the game? We have we have friends lists and we have clan lists. So you, you can definitely co-op in with your friends and, and work together. In fact, you know, obviously every game that I play, you know, at Petroglyph, when we're testing the game, you know, if we get a group of designers or a group of like production assistants that all happen to be like having their headphones on and be playing and conversing and and uh, working on their strategy together, those guys obviously win. So, um, you know, we want this game being that it, you know it does have an MMO element. The social element is extremely important to it, and we want to encourage people to to find friends and play together. And so, you know, the matchmaking also takes that into consideration. So, you can build a friends list, and then yeah, you can also build a clan. So that your clan can work together and you know and 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 play together and, and just just like a guild in an MMO RPG. Is there any recognition for clan victories within the wider meta game? There are that's still under discussion. We definitely want to have that. It, we might not have it at initial launch, but it's definitely you know it's definitely something we really really want. We want to encourage clans to be able to compete against each other and to really you know be able to have bragging rights against other clans. Now, the other question has got to be on the subject of actual competitive play when it comes to End of Nations. The competitive RTS scene is, let's just say, a little narrow at the moment as a result of a lack of games that are truly supporting it. Are there any plans for Petroglyph to support any sort of esports scene in this Oh, game? we would love that. We've got a lot of uh, esports e um, fans, and uh, we'd love it. We don't have it in the, incorporated in the game at, at this time. And, uh, but it's definitely something that we'd like to do. You know, as we launch later this summer, it's something that we'd really love to incorporate in as we as we go live. Fantastic. Well, there you go, folks. That is a look at End of Nations and the brand new two versus two map. Now, you were mentioning beta coming not so far away. When can we expect that? Yeah, beta is only weeks out. So we're, we're we've got alpha running now, and uh, beta is just weeks away. And then launch will be at the end of summer. So it, it's coming fast. And where do they have to go to sign up for that? Endofnations.com. Fantastic. Nice and easy to remember. There you go. Mike Lake, thank you very much for talking to us today. Much appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, End of Nations coming sooner than you might think to a PC near you. Check out endofnations.com for beta signups. Be quick. They are going fast, and this will be kicking off in a few weeks. Uh, Thanks so much. No problem whatsoever. My name is Pete Tolbiscuit, live here once again from E3, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.